I'm joined by Paul Pullman, business leader, campaigner, co-author of Net Positive and former CEO of Unilever. Paul, thank you very much for joining us at uh, the Sustainability Project. Um, so I'd love to know what sustainability innovation you're most excited about that you think has the biggest opportunity. Well, there's a lot happening in this space and we really are getting close to tipping points on the energy transition with uh, solar and wind. 90% of the country is now cheaper. We're seeing it in transport with the electric vehicles. We're actually starting to see it in uh, agriculture, mm. with regenerative agriculture, etc. So I'm excited about those things, uh, driven for a great deal by technology, but also a lot of hard work for pe with, by people. But what I'm probably the most excited about is the increasing uh, number of partnerships that are being formed across industries, with civil society, with governments, because we're at a point that these issues are actually of uh, such magnitude that nobody can solve it alone anymore. Mm -hmm. So it's at that level where you have the Mission Possible Partnership, the Food Collective, the Fashion Pact, where really industries go together, sometimes within an industry, sometimes across, to tackle these tougher challenges. Mm. And so what do you see as the, the biggest challenge then that we face in terms of forging that sustainable future? Well, the bigger challenge we change is actually it's not the science which tells us what to do. Mm. It's not the money of which we have plenty. It's actually not the technology either because we can solve 80, 90% of the issues today if we decided to do so. So the bigger challenge we have is actually within these 10 centimeters here, which mm. is a human willpower. Uh, many would have argued, many would argue that this is not a crisis of climate change or food insecurity or deforestation. These are symptoms. Uh, the real crisis probably is in at the level of greed or apathy or selfishness. Mm. So it's the human uh, side and we just need to get the right uh, leaders in charge of many of these institutions now, be it at the government level, be it at the, the company levels to move the things forward. So mm. that's probably the bigger thing that we need right now. And I know you do a lot of work with sort of next generation leaders, the sort of young leaders. What do you do, you know, in that work, can you tell us about that work and does that give you hope? Well, it does give me hope, an enormous hope. And if you look at the millennials or the Gen Cs, you see definitely that they are more values-based. Uh, but more importantly now, we're at the moment that uh, in most of the companies, half of their workforce uh, are millennials or Gen Cs. Mm. Uh, most organizations deal with a workforce that is not 100% motivated. And what you see with the Gen Cs and millennials above all, uh, although it is true for the whole population, they want companies to be uh, part of the solution. They want companies to be values-based, and if a company doesn't fully deliver on that, they get disengaged. Up to a point that 30% uh, of people have said they have consciously quit companies because they weren't delivering on the plans that they thought they should do in terms of contribution to society. 50% are thinking they're consciously quitting. So we're moving from a moment of uh, silent, silent quitting, if you want to, to conscious quitting, and that's a major, major a red flag for CEOs that I would pay attention to. Yeah, how do you see that trend impacting the broader climate movement? Do you think it will incentivize or sort of wake CEOs to wake, wake them up a bit to pay attention? You know, to be honest, when I was uh, CEO for 10 years with Unilever, it really would be inconceivable to think that uh, employees would uh, walk out or write letters or mm. go public, and that has changed in the last three, four, five years enormously. You have 8,000 employees in Amazon who walk out to tell Jeff Bezos that he cannot be part of the problem of climate change, but has to be part of the solution. Unfortunately, it made him change. You have people walk out because they don't want their companies to deliver mattresses to the border in Mexico where children get separated from parents. You have uh, consultants, uh, a thousand consultants who write letters to their management and say, stop consulting with companies that make this world worse. Mm. We need to concentrate on making it better. So this, this force is enormous. And when you think that uh, we're in London now, 65% of employers say they have a hard time filling all the positions with the quality people. You want to work a little bit harder to ensure that you not only can attract that talent, but that they also stay engaged in the in work and, and what our studies show is that uh, companies that set a high ambition, uh, companies that communicate very clearly what they do and put word in action, and companies that give agency, especially to these younger people, tend to be better placed mm. in keeping a highly engaged workforce. And uh, I would say in all fairness, that's worth the investment now. Mm. So um, you mentioned that mindset's the biggest challenge, but we are asking everyone that we're interviewing, uh, if you had 100 billion US dollars, what would you invest in? 
Well, 100 billion US dollars is not that much anymore. If, uh, you know, uh, Aramco just announced 156 billion profits and the fossil industry in total, I'd, I'd certainly encourage them first to look at that money and not give 95% back to shareholders and, and in special dividends or, or share buybacks, but to spend a little bit more on the energy transition. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't ask anybody for the 100 million. We have enough 100 millions laying around there. But if you gave me 100 billion, uh, the first thing I would do is, is fulfill our promises that we've made in 2009 already to the Green Climate Fund. There is a real level of mistrust between the what we would call conveniently the emerging markets, which is 80% of the world, and the Western, more developed uh, economies. And if we cannot keep our commitments that we've made uh, in terms of uh, the climate fund, uh, we will never build the trust that we need to solve these issues that are increasingly global. Mm. So I'd re replenish that fund and say now, hopefully, we'll have a higher level of cooperation and and, uh, and confidence in, in working with each other. And then the second thing I would do is probably invest in education, especially uh, girls once more, um, because you know, you're still living in a world where 246 million children don't have access to education. And what we find over and over again is that where the population is better educated, especially again focusing on women and girls, the economies tend to do better, mm. also as far as climate change is concerned. Mm. So that's the investment side. What about government policy? If you had just one policy <laughs> that you could choose that you think would be a real game changer for, for sustainable goals? Well, it's difficult to say uh, mm -hmm. one government policy, but I think the most important one probably would be to put a price on these externalities, a price on carbon. And I think that would be a, a very uh, good signal. We have now 24% of the global carbon emissions fall on the uh, carbon pricing or cap and trade systems. That number is slowly going up, China coming in now. We do see a difference. We see a clear difference amongst companies that have set an internal price versus the ones that don't, mm. about jurisdictions where you have pricing systems. You have to value these externalities to get the money to flow to the right areas to solve these issues. And mm. so that's probably one of the most important things to do. And the second one is I would put um, uh, science-based targets for nature higher on the agenda. Mm. Uh, many of the governments now are discovering that we cannot solve climate change just by looking at the narrower definition of the energy transition, but that we also need to look at nature-based solutions. But yet few of them are able to translate that into concrete action. So I'd probably look at that area as well. Mm. And what do you think about the sort of recent global action on biodiversity? Do you think it's good and how do you think it can be sustained? Well, we had a fairly reasonable outcome on, in Montreal. We were all there. Um, you know, but then it was disappointing in Egypt where nature-based solutions were taken out of the text at the end. Uh, in, um, in the UAE, we're trying to get food on the agenda again. It's about uh, mitigation, adaptation, uh, finance, but then it's also uh, about uh, food that will get some attention there. So, but there are very few countries still that have really integrated it into their nationally determined commitments or that have deep decarbonization plans based on nature-based solutions. So there is some work to do still. So I think uh, Montreal put a stake in the ground. It was probably better than most people expected, but certainly not enough for us is where we need to be and we need to keep pushing at that. And one of the, I just came back from Brazil uh, two weeks ago, and one of the things that we now need to do is, is really find uh, mechanisms to reward uh, countries like that for uh, natural capital and, and have money start to flow in those directions. It's a wonderful opportunity now that the stars are aligned, where you have Indonesia, six years of reduction in deforestation, where you have a change of government in Brazil, which now respects the forest code and wants to reverse this incredible uh, accelerated trend of deforestation we've seen, where you have the Congo, our last tropical forest, coming together. So if we can bring those together, uh, we have a South-South solution. Uh, it happens to be that the G20s and the, the COPs are also now in the South. Mm. So finally, I think we might see something that, that, that respects and that recognizes the contributions that those countries make and, and need to make in terms of helping solve the climate crisis and financially reward them for that. Mm. And so what are some of the key outcomes you hope will be achieved with COP28 and w will you be there? Well, no, I will be there. I haven't missed a beat in the last uh, 15 uh, uh, COPs. I wish I would have had less and the issue would have been mm. wiped off the table. But the outcome has to be undoubtedly uh, 
uh, the end of fossil fuel has to be on the agenda. We have to be much more explicit about that than what we, what we got out of uh, Egypt. There will undoubtedly, as I said, be talks about uh, further mitigation, adaptation, loss and damage that needs to be picked up, uh, financing. Uh, these are important topics. Uh, I think now with the Bridgestone Initiative, where we look at the multilateral finance institutions and try to see if we can unlock more of this catalytic funding to help especially the emerging markets will be a good sign of confidence and that we want to see also happen in, uh, in, uh, in the UAE. Uh, Nature-based solutions have to come higher on the foreground. The appointment of Razan and Miriam for uh, food itself are, are from some very strong appointments that we would certainly support. And then, you know, the UAE is looking for tangible actions on the ground. They're looking at more South-South collaboration and examples. And they're looking to work much closer with countries like Brazil or India or others to have that continuity in the process and not every year a disruption. So it's not a, an end point in itself. It will be another milestone again. But I'm fairly confident, I think, that we can uh, push some of these issues forward now in a more defining way, despite the concerns that some people have, which is valid because it sets the bar higher, but I, I, I do think that we have a possibility to positively surprise us. Mm. Last question. You talk about net positive. How does that differ from net zero, and how can companies move beyond net zero to net positive? Well, zero is not positive. You know, zero is not being good, not being bad. And unfortunately, World Overshoot Day last year was July 28th, which is the day that we use up more resources than the world can replenish. Every day after, we're actually stealing from future generations. We're living well beyond our planetary boundaries. And we're paying the price for that. 70% of species have disappeared over the last five decades. Birds, amphibians, reptiles. When is it our turn? In our lifetime, we've cut down 50% of the world's forests. It just doesn't work anymore. So we need to start thinking restorative, reparative, regenerative. And that's really the essence of net positive. It goes well beyond net zero in that sense. And as we talk in the book, it also focuses on the broader systems changes that are needed to achieve that. So it lifts it in, uh, it lifts it really frankly from our current state of thinking, which you find in 95% of the CSR reports that companies now issue, which is basically a less bad state of being, mm -hmm. less carbon uh, emissions, less deforestation, less plastic in the oceans, to a thinking of how can I actually um, take more carbon out of the air, move to regenerative agriculture, become water positive. Uh, nature, by its design, is regenerative. Nature actually has no waste. Waste is invented by human beings, so I also think we can uninvent it, and that's the whole idea behind net positive. Brilliant. Excellent. Paul, thank you thank very you. much for joining us. Oh, thanks for the opportunity. Enjoyed it.